At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Chris Jones. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Jones. I'm the Director of Communications at the National Association for Business Economics. I uh, are pleased to present today's webinar. Uh, I did want to mention a few upcoming NAEB events. Uh, we have links to the NAEB calendar uh, dropped on the webinar screen. Um, of course, uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak, NAEB is committed to getting this information out there. Um, these events are all free to the public. Uh, feel free to pass them on to uh, through your networks. Um, and uh, we do have uh, the next event coming up on Monday, which is um, our economic forecast and impact of COVID-19. Uh, it's a teleconference on March 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will have a policy roundtable discussion on Tuesday, March 24th at 1 p.m. Uh, concerning the U.S. fiscal policy responses to address the labor market consequences. Uh, then we will have a manufacturing uh, industry webinar on March 25th covering manufacturing and supply chain impact. Uh, and then a NAVE Energy Roundtable webinar on Tuesday, March 31st um, covering the impact of the coronavirus on the global oil market. As a reminder, the uh, recordings of all NAVE webinars are on the NAVE Digital Archive, which is under the Events tab on NAVE.com. Uh, those are available for NAVE members. If you're interested in joining NAVE, uh, you can go to NAVE.com slash join. Uh, we have a link uh, on the webinar screen for that as well. All information on our membership can be found at NAVE.com slash join. Okay, I'd also like to just quickly mention that we have a new jobs board relaunched. Uh, it is econjobs.org. Uh, head over to econjobs.org to find your next job or post open jobs at your firm. Okay, on to today's event. Um, as a reminder, this event will be recorded and posted on the Made Digital Archive later today. Uh, the webinar will include a question and answer period after the presentations. However, if you have a question, you can submit it at any time during today's event. Just type the question into the box on the left side of the window and then click on send. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Yale Sussman, Chief Economist at KPMG in the UK. Yale, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, the latest um, of what's happening in China. China was the first country to experience COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic, what it is uh, now, and it is very interesting, therefore, to understand where it is and how fast it is moving um, to recover from the, um, the break the outbreak, as well as the implications that such a large economy will have on the um, global economy and, and, and the, the interaction between the rest of the world and the Chinese economy over these, com these coming months. So today we have two excellent speakers. We have Alicia Garcia Herrero from um, NETFIS, the Chief Economist for Asia Pacific, and we also have with us Wei Yao the Chief Economist for Asia, Pacific, and China for Societe Generale. They are each going to take us through the latest, um, the latest data and, and, and outlook for China, and then we will have time for questions. So please um, send us as many questions as you can through the, um, through the web links that you have. So let's start with Alicia. Um, Alicia, would you like to take us through your view? Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about um, basically the China's outlook in as far as the shock is concerned for, for the first two months and what our expectation is for the first quarter. And then, um, talk a little bit about how the global economy now, i.e. The, the actual pandemic, the spread of the virus, may reverberate or may really impact China's economy, so kind of a double warm type idea, and um, the stimulus measures that China is taking, and in our opinion, will continue to take in, in the sense that it will step up because of this second wave of, of um, pandemic uh, from their perspective. 
Um, so I will also talk at the, as a second part a little bit about uh, global value chains very, very briefly just to look at the centrality of China in that discussion. So um, as regards the impact, and then immediately after the, uh, the stimulus measures, uh, I just want to show you a few graphs of what has been happening, as you know, uh, since we got the first PMI data uh, for January, February, which was very scary. Uh, we all knew that, you know, that data was very meaningful. You know, as far as we were already, all of us basically expecting a recession in China in the first quarter, um, and especially the service PMI was was absolutely appalling and and beyond the numbers it to me it kind of gave me this gave me this signal the signal that um Chinese economic authorities and for that matter um their view of statistics if I may say so would publish a negative number. I mean it, it was kind of a recognition that they would go all the way to publish a negative number for the first quarter. And in fact, um, the, data, the more recent data, retail sales, success investment, as you see, you know, it just says it all. It, it's, it's going to be a clear recession for the first quarter. And uh, you also see a collapse in, in, in trade, especially in exports. Uh, and this is partially because of the um, supply chain disruption, less so imports. And there's been a lot of discussion as to why the, in, the volume imports was only minus five, whether this was partially because of the commitments with the U.S. on the phase one trade deal, or maybe, you know, simply past orders that China uh, actually continued to process in terms of imports. But, but the point is that, as you see, everything collapses uh, in those first two months. Uh, we also produce the homemade um, sentiment analysis for manufacturing based on GDL for so big data analysis. And the very important thing is that, um, yes, at the peak, so basically first uh, week of February, so right after uh, Chinese New Year, uh, the sentiment was extremely negative as regards the manufacturing sector, and it's moved up until very recently. So. So this is a signal of what may come, meaning how much this uh, globalization, if I may say, of, of, the, of, of the shock, at least in the West so far, will, will clearly affect China. Um, and it may affect China because of, you know, basically lack of demand or even the, on the supply shock uh, Kind of a reverberation of the of the supply shock because the global value chain, while concentrated in China, also has obviously parts and components coming from Europe, from the U.S., etc. So, so that I think it's important to realize that already in this in this very um, timely data, uh, not of course uh, hard data whatsoever, but you can already see that that if not in terms of contagion cases, the minimal and most of them are imported, it's more about the economic impact of the global fallout because of the pandemic that, that we should focus on. Um, the, the next graph shows uh, that idea. I mean, this is harder data than obviously that sentiment analysis that, yes, the economy is coming back. We're not yet back to 100, and this is the six week after the the um, outbreak started, the coronavirus outbreak started, but you can already see that in inner city transportation intensity or daily housing transactions, etc., are recovering. They're not yet necessarily back to previous levels, although some, like coal usage or you know, they are coming up, but not yet to the full uh, level where we were. So we're still not basically um, growing from the base we had last year, if I may say so. So we are still uh, on, it, on this recessionary mode, even so far um, in, 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 in March. Um, a way to see that is to focus on the hard hit sectors, which can't but be consumer durables, uh, real estate, meaning you know those more important other consumption or investment decisions that households need to take, and 
you can see from this graph when we compare from Chinese New Year to six weeks after Chinese New Year, which is where we are now, the difference between 18 and 19, which, which weren't great years for China anyway, especially 19, and to, and today, 2020. So, so there's been weeks, and this was at the heart of the coronavirus outbreak, so one week after Chinese New Year, where car sales were literally new in China. And we're basically about half of where we were in, in 2019 for that six weeks after Chinese New Year, which in itself is quite uh, a problem because car sales were negative last year. So, so, so this idea of the V shape, I'm going to start right there. I mean, when you see these numbers, you realize how hard it is because 2019 was already difficult, especially the autos and, and, and to some extent the real estate, but not to that degree. And you see that we're not even getting close to where we were. On housing transactions, the story is very similar. Uh, and as, and I, I, I won't get into detail, but when you look at housing, um, so land purchases by developers is slightly better. They're picking up more. So it seems they're trying to you know, put aside land to probably build once restrictions are lifted. And I'll, come, I'll go back to that point, which may be controversial because not everybody agrees on the fact that the real estate may be back to support China's growth. But our point is because of this uh, second round, if I may say, from the global to, into China, so the lack, the impossibility basically for China to insulate itself, we do think that the extraordinary measures or things that, that the leadership said they would never do, such as you know, housing is for living, not for speculation, all of that will happen. That's our call, basically, which allows us to have a meager growth of 3% this year, so, notwithstanding those measures. And I'll get there. I just want to kind of tell you the story, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quicker now on, on the rest of the slides. So, um, yes, we all know that a lot of monetary measures have been taken in terms of not, not yet, like, quantitative easing in the sense of, you know, everything we've been seeing today, Australia, et cetera, but rather, you know, the, the usual suspects, what China generally does. So cutting rates, cut, cutting reserve requirements, a little bit of more window guidance to lend to the private sector and in particular the SMEs. But something quite important is happening, which frankly, in my opinion, is also a very much uh, subject to uh, the, the spike in uh, global risk aversion. So not necessarily only China's transmission mechanism. Yes, there's partially that problem. It's been there for a long time. But there's also this idea that as risk is perceived or, you know, more, more obviously, if I may say, in the rest of the world, these will be affecting the sectors in China that are most dependent on, fu on funding, so more leverage, and in particular, leverage offshore. There's a very clear uh, differentiation between um, Chinese high-yield issuers onshore and offshore. So those that have basically uh, hovered around the onshore market for a long time, local governments, as opposed to real estate developers, which have been most keen on, you know, on tapping the offshore market, you can see that their, so this is POE, so private companies in the offshore market have seen a, a, a recent spike in, in the cost of funding. And this, this is in itself worrisome because that's the most leveraged sector in China. And um, one has to realize that they need business. I mean, and this is one more reason why we're having this strong call that, that yes, the real estate is back and that some of the restrictions for, for households purchases will be lifted. Uh, it might be subtle. It might not be necessarily announced uh, widely because of the mantra before, but we, we think it's coming. Um, how much room does the BOC have to conduct uh, lax for monetary policy? Well, first of all, um, you know, people used to worry about inflation both last year, but also uh, at the beginning of the outbreak. Um, because of supply constraints, but frankly, in my opinion, this is overall, and especially once you look at the 
the world and on the China situation, uh, uh, you know, a demand shock, and and therefore, I think there is an increase in recognition that inflation should not be a limit for the PBOC. Most importantly, not even uh, global financial conditions are a limit because, you know, basically financial conditions, at least not necessarily credit, uh, sorry, not necessarily risky assets, but all of the rest will be enjoying all of the stimulus measures that the Fed, the ECB, et cetera, but especially the Fed have been taken. Uh, have been taken. Um, the other very important thing to realize is that other than this, uh, you know, um, orthodox or regular, if I may say, monetary policy that China always uses, um, two things are happening, um, and we think will happen even more. One is the shadow banking may be back, not necessarily with the very same definition, we had before, it might be more subtle. We think that one way to do it is for the PBOC to lift partially the, its macro potential assessment and in particular the, the funding uh, limits. So, that, so the limits that the PBOC imposes on banks are actually only relevant for smaller banks because those are the banks that are more dependent on, on, on funding, um, basically short um, and, and the larger banks lend it in the interbank, inter, interbank market, but they had kind of limits to, to get that type of funding and wealth management products, which is part of the shadow banking, were also limited. We think this is going to be lifted for, for very simple reasons, same as the real estate developers. These are risky banks. This is basically high-yield story affected by an increase in the perception of risk. We had already five uh, banks intervening last year and the coronavirus and its outbreak and the clients from these banks, which are mainly real, uh, sorry, uh, private companies, uh, will make it so difficult that we think the PBC has no uh, no other choice than being leaner or more lenient. With, uh, with these banks, and therefore we think that some of these con- con- uh, con- uh, constraints to the shadow banking will be lifted. And again, maybe not publicized fully, but lifted. On the remedy, we have this call that um, basically uh, we've seen a cut, kind of a nice behavior in renminbi compared to the rest of Asian countries or yen currencies, and we think that this was a signal to, to kind of highlight the decoupling that supports the hypothetical decoupling, because I don't think China can decouple. I have to leave that very clear. But at least a signal from the leadership that that China was recovering and that while others were entering a, a negative spiral, China was leaving that negative spiral. So the renminbi, in a way, has reflected that. I'm not saying that is pure intervention, but really the fact that the, the, the reading of what was happening was very positive in relative terms uh, for China. So, but we still think that that short of demand policies or or, or short of non cost non costly demand policies. So we're talking about you know real estate or shadow banking, which are um, kind of taboo in a way. Um, short of of easier uh, easier policies, we think that remedy could still be used. And it's only a question of when. I mean, if if, if China has already convinced the world that is that it is indeed at least partially decoupling, um, it, it's not hard to follow other EM currencies. So so we are not very very convinced that maybe we hover around seven for the foreseeable future. It might be that it is indeed necessary, also because the. The collapse of external demand from the rest of the world is massive, and and you know all of I guess everybody's projection in for 2020 after the coronavirus outbreak for China was kind of oh let's leave external demand as it was, which is one and a half percent strong of GDP, and to get to a growth rate maybe hopefully close to the government target somewhere below six. I'm saying this was kind of the beginning at the at the outset of the outbreak. Today, all of this is absolutely impossible. I mean, nobody, I, I hope, is thinking that China can grow at, at that level. And therefore, um, you know, that 
external uh, demand um, uh, story will probably not be there. Thus, the pressure for the remedy to be used is, in our opinion, uh, significant, although I wouldn't say that is totally sure because it also depends on relations with the U.S., the G20, you name it. I mean, there's many, many things beyond that. What is very clear, though, is that China's um, leverage will continue to increase. Why? Because everything we're seeing on the monetary side, on the fiscal side, which I will go into in a moment, is um, expansion in terms of, you know, leverage and, and certainly public debt. Um, so what are the fiscal measures moving to fiscal? So we think that um, there's been already some uh, city-level um, subsidies for consumer durables. We think that this is going to be generalized, but but don't expect too much from this because it doesn't really mean that the pent-up demand will be there. It, it wasn't there even the inside, so you know, it's, it's not easy to make people consume even if you give them vouchers. I mean, if they're scared, they're scared. So so we think this will happen, but it might not be as effective as, as you know, as expected. Infrastructure, for sure, because there's been a collapse in infrastructure. So, so you know, it has to go back to level that was already very low, 2019, as, as you see there. I mean, it collapsed also all of the uncertainty about the trade war and, and many other issues. So we think there's room here, but of course, for this to happen, um, there needs to be uh, funding, and local governments need to uh, fund, uh, find the funding by issuing debt. Uh, there's been a lot of front loading, and especially about you know, bonds. I mean, a lot of issues, but um, it needs to be channeled to actual infrastructure investment. And we know from 2019 that uh, local governments may actually hoard that liquidity. Remember that uh, the revenue stream is, is looks dif- I mean, difficult in terms, given that it's 60% land sales. So they may hoard rather than just invest. So that's a risk. Um, and this is basically what what you have there. So what has already been issued, I'm going to go very fast because I know I'm short of time. Very last point on the global value chain, why the shock was so big, why why the supply story, other than, of course, the collapsing demand, is relevant. Well, it is relevant because China has become the center, literally, of export of intermediate goods in the world, as you can see there. Um, this is um, global value chain data, contact data. Um, so, so by China, so, so average um, market share is of export is about 19, but for intermediate goods, we're talking about over 30. So, so China has become, and you can see that. Uh, I'm going to move fast. Uh, in the share of um, export of capital goods or intermediate goods be much bigger um, and with a w- bigger gap as opposed to imports than con- consumer goods. So China is no longer the king of you know, cheap or even not cheap consumer goods, export, exports of consumer goods, but rather of capital goods. That's very important to realize. So the minute the supply chain was affected, the whole world basically was... was um, in the consequences of that in their own for their own inputs of production. Um, so I'm going to conclude by saying that um, yes, China first was at the center, so it suffered a lot the first two quarters. There's many lessons I think for the rest of the world to learn from the cost um, and why there was such a, there has been such a big cost. This brings us to lockdown or no, suppression versus containment on all of these things we've all probably learned by now about, you know, strategies for a pandemic. But I think it's important to relate the two. I'm not arguing that it's a trade off, but I think we know what we are heading. If we want to head there and, and if not, what are the consequences? That's a different story, but I think relevant to learn from China. And China has different experiments as well across provinces. So I think it's quite an important thing to analyze. Um and the other thing is that now China is no longer at the center of the outbreak, surely. But 
it can't insulate itself from what is becoming the center of the outbreak, because this is Europe and the U.S. And therefore, that double warming um, should bring us, bring us all to basically revising our Chinese project, China's projections, in my opinion, downward. So we, we are kind of we were hovering between 2 and 3%, and, you know, it's hard to put a very low number. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, that's where it might end up being, which is very, very low growth for China. So if we end up in two, so it's like one-third of last year, it's a huge shock for the economy. Um, it's a, sh- a huge shock for the world because we expect, as happened already in 2019 for the first time in years, China to con- China China's imports to go basically negatively and no longer contribute to um, global import uh, import growth. So so that's the difference. Not only will China grow less, is that it's, it's what China may give to the global economy in terms of spillovers, imports, maybe much less than in 2008. And perhaps the other thing on the financial conditions and how the Fed and the else affect China, as I said, I think the key here is that it's given PBOC more room to be laxer, except for high yield credit in the offshore market is, is not the biggest thing to worry about. But I'm saying, yes, I, ironically, I mean, it looks great for the PBOC. It's great, but only if uh, the perception of risk um, is controlled. In, in 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 dollar, if there were to be any kind of which there is in the market, but I mean increasingly so, dollar shortage. This could create some waves uh, waves in China as well. And finally, I just want to add that uh, the very negative data that China published recently could have another reading other than just showing that the situation was very difficult. And I think it's a little bit like coordination by threat, if I may use that word, meaning China wants to show the world, and especially the West, how costly um, this outbreak may be, uh, so that uh, policies are taken preemptively to uh, reduce the economic impact so that China itself doesn't get hit further out of the, wo- the world's um, uh, maybe depression. I mean, it's hard to tell. It's not up to me to, to to say because nobody knows. But we could be there. So I think that that's what I mean by coordination by threat. That kind of by using these horrendous numbers, it's putting pressure on all on all of us. It's putting pressure on the way we deal with the um, coronavirus, but it's also putting pressure on our uh, policies to uh, uh, to react to it. So that's, I think, an important thing to realize, um, and I leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. That was very helpful and already answered some of my questions and the questions that we've uh, had coming through. But before we go to those, let's, let's hear from Wei. Okay, sure. Thank you. Actually, Alicia did a very good job uh, <laughs> explaining a lot of things. I think, you know, for me, I... I'd like to add a few points. Uh, first, uh, of course, we have to make forecasts. But I don't think that's, that's very important because we are literally revising the numbers like almost every week, depending on the situation. Um, but I think for China, the key things to watch is indeed, you know, the, the pace of recovery of how fast people are returning to work and the, the, the pace of recovery in the capacity utilization rate. Uh, and the policy uh, response. So these are the key things definitely to watch. But um, I think before before I go on to these key things to watch, uh, another maybe um, kind of aspect, you know, maybe it's, it's kind of a lesson for everyone in terms of, okay, so Europe this week uh, has started to do some serious lockdown. So how far are we from getting the situation uh, contained? Right? So... I think China here offers some lesson. Um, one, you know, if if you look at Italy, uh, which decided to go for lockdown when its uh, medical system actually is already at the brink of total exhaustion, uh, so that's pretty much like the situation Wuhan had at the end of uh, January. So in that situation, Wuhan took 
uh, nearly two months to get out of it, get out, get, get, getting things properly in a container, you know. But uh, by bearing in mind that Wuhan had the support of the entire medical system from all over China, basically China sent doctors all over China to Wuhan to, to and they built the, 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 the hospitals in, in two weeks' time. So, so, you know, that gives you some timeline, the challenge in terms of, you know, um, how how these economy how these countries already kind of have their medical system brought down can get out of there how long it could, it could take uh, whereas the situation in France and Germany and some parts of the US uh, it's more um, if we have to compare it's more like the situation in China outside of Wuhan where things are heading towards the direction that there is a clear risk you know the medical system could get overwhelmed but the lockdown happens just before then. Uh, if uh, if if the if the comparison is is relevant, then we are still looking at at least a, a month or two, a month half uh, for the outbreak to be contained. Um, but the the real difficult job actually may start after the lockdown, i.e. the recovery part. Alicia already kind of showed some good charts and the points. You know, it's actually not easy. Um, the Right now, you can say you know maybe ninety percent, eighty to ninety percent of companies have started, uh, have opened their doors, have switched on the factory, have resumed production. That's true. But if you look at the capacity utilization, you know which number, whichever number you look at, energy consumption, um, the steel capacity utilization, the steel inventory, housing sales, traffic. Everything tells you the economy is running at best 65, maybe 70 percent of its full capacity. Which, what you know, just just a reference, the full the the normal capacity level is not 100 percent. It's close to 80 percent, right? So, so the capacity utilization after six weeks, um, uh, you know, since the lockdown was lifted in uh, everywhere other than Wuhan, uh, it's still below. Uh, the normal capacity level by 10 basis points, uh, 10, po 10 percentage points. Huh. So why the recovery is so difficult? There were several reasons for it. One, you know, at the beginning it was a labor shortage because people are worried about going back and catching the, you know, the, the, the virus again. Then now this is much less a problem. But there is also, then another problem is the lingering supply disruptions within China, meaning that, let's say, for a complex supply chain, uh, of electronics, if you have maybe one or two even small companies shut down, you're missing something, then you can't resume working. But you have to wait for them to switch, not only switch back on, but uh, stop producing. Then you can have the whole supply chain moving more smoothly. But now I think uh, with the trajectory of people coming back to work, uh, I do think by the end of this month, all these supply issues could be resolved. I think what will happen next is the demand problem will be much more obvious. Uh, the demand problem will come both domestically and externally. I think that the external situation is is very clear. Domestically, you know, we're also seeing signs that the, there is a clear income shock to the households. Uh, not to mention, there is a very clear uh, revenue uh, drop uh, for a lot of companies. So think about it with with this kind of damage on the balance sheet of both households and corporates. Who would be so quick to buy things like cars and housing, you know, big ticket items, luxury bags, uh, and who would be so eager to invest right away? Right. So, so this brings to the next question about the policy response. So, in terms of the policy response, China has. So, I I, I kind of summarize into two parts or two steps. The first step is for the policymakers to make sure everyone can survive. I'm not just talking about. Uh, people who who get treated, you know, they can live their life. Also, talking about companies can will still be there after everything's over. I mean, the outbreak is over. So the Chinese government was pretty much focused on that um, as in February and up until maybe early uh, March. I mean, even until now, you know, the focus is about everyone can survive, which is also I think gladly to see. You know, a lot of the um, uh, Western central banks and governments are also catching up on that, you know. And in these part of the policy includes anything uh, uh, 
about reducing fixed costs for the companies, right? So tax exemptions, uh, deferrals, cutting back social charges, uh, uh, bad loan forbearance, uh, targeted credit support. You know, China has done you know the whole uh, kitchen sink of policies there. But the next batch of the policy is about the demand problem I mentioned. It's about how to revive demand and to what extent. I think there, there is no question that China needs to do stimulus. Uh, and the most important stimulus is actually not the monetary policy, is not the standalone fiscal policy, is a total all-out credit-supported infrastructure investment stimulus. Uh, when you think about 2009, 2016, the weapon, the biggest weapon the Chinese government has is never, you know, one from one ministry, one part of the government is, you know, total kind of mobilization of the resources of the entire banking system to to plug in the lost demand by government investment or cause by government investment and to revive the demand, uh, domestic aggregate demand very quickly. Uh, this is something other governments are not able to do. And China did it not only once but twice in the past 10 years. But the cost is very clear. The Chinese government actually, you know, starting three years ago, was trying very, very hard to do deleveraging, to reduce the debt risk, to clean up the bad, uh, shadow banking system, to contain the local government's borrowing from backdoor. This is actually the reason why the infrastructure growth was so low in 2018-19, less than 4%. So now the dilemma they have is, how do they balance the situation of short-term versus long-term? Uh, it is extraordinary time. Of course, you know, it requires extraordinary action. So I think there is, the question is definitely not if, but how much they will switch back to the investment stimulus approach. At the moment, the signals we can see is that they're willing but not too willing. Now, how, how do I say that? Is because... At the beginning, President Xi Jinping said, insisted that China will meet the growth target or every target this year. And the growth target, which is implied here, is actually 5.6% to double the GDP in 10 years or so. But last week, Premier Li Keqiang at the State Council meeting said that it doesn't really matter what the growth, exactly what the growth rate will be. What matters is the labor market will be stable. So I think that's a pretty clear kind of rethinking there. I think that there is a doubt now among the Chinese policymakers. How much do we really need to do now to you know, bring back the growth? Maybe we should wait for the data to see how big the damage is in terms of from the external demand. Also, we need to be really careful not to repeat the mistake of 2009 in terms of doing whatever it takes at the cost of, you know, long-term debt sustainability. So this hesitation or this, this kind of dilemma is still very, uh, it's still, I think it's still quite uh, visib kind of visible among the Chinese policymakers that their willingness to do everything to save the Chinese economy at the same time save the world is definitely much smaller than 2009 and 2016. So what do we expect here is... We do think they have to do something because the external demand will hurt the manufacturing sector badly. And the, the, there are still 20 to 30 million jobs linked to all these external demands. So they cannot afford not to do anything, even, even if they don't care as much about the growth rate as before. Uh, so we do think you know, they, they will do infrastructure, but it's more going to be a reactive process, meaning that they are judging how bad the situation is outside of China, then to offer more and more and more. You know, it's not just going to be, it's, it's, they're, it's, it's less likely they're going to kind of just go all in now. So this measure approach, what does it mean? Is that uh, we, we, we do think, you know, because of the scope China government has, they can stabilize the situation with the tools they have. Um, but if we're talking about a positive spillovers, you know, re-inflationary kind of impulse from China to the rest of the world, uh, our hope should not be so high this time. And um, and so so the you know talking about you know the debt concern, you know exactly because of that concern, I think they will be careful not to do too much. Obviously, you know it's a very very delicate calculation here. How much is too much, right? But 
at, at least in, at the beginning, the willingness is not as high. I think one thing, you know, about the debt risk is uh, I absolutely agree with Alicia's view. You know, there is extern- this external debt problem, which, however, can be, you know, addressed with PBOC's balance sheet. Uh, even though I think you know the PBOC may not have to do something directly to save all these uh, private bonds, U.S. dollar bonds sh- issued by the private companies in China, they still have all these balance sheets they can tap from the state-owned financial institutions. Talking about state banks, talking about state insurance houses, you know they have some dollar positions. Maybe they can help first before PBOC have to step in. And talking about uh, the the uh, uh, the debt risk inside of chi- inside China, uh, indeed, the small banks are the most fragile link in the financial system. Uh, the forbearance, for sure, they will, you know, at, at least the PBOC will give everybody a bit more time uh, to to deal with their shadow bank shadow banking debt. But I I I differ somewhat in terms of you know whether they will totally lift the shadow banking restrictions. I think I think the question is, you know, um, I, I think right now at least the thinking right it, it thinking from the Chinese policymakers is they, they still want to finish you know the, the regulatory reform which which they have already put in place in the past two years. Uh, it's just that everybody potentially will need more time and also you know if we do get a situation that small banks may have to go under we could see more preemptive restructuring cases. Actually, we have already got several restructuring of small banks uh, last year. And again, you know, the Chinese government really didn't use its own money. They have, again, these uh, state-owned pockets they can tap to contain the risk. So, uh, so, so in, a, in a good, in a somewhat positive lie, uh, maybe this, uh, this. Uh, Big stress would push China to do that restructuring even a bit faster, at least for the for the zombie companies, zombie financial institutions. Um, maybe that's a slightly positive angle here. Then talking about um, the the spill over the supply chain problems, uh, the the you know the the sector. China is absolutely very critical in this supply chain. Besides the things that Alicia already mentioned. I think another point that we found in our research is uh, talking about you know finding alternative to China's uh, supply. It's actually much more difficult than people thought. Right? Last year during the trade war, there were a lot of thinking there suggesting you know maybe we can go to Vietnam, maybe we can go to Southeast Asia. Uh, then this year, what happened is we we found out Vietnam actually rely very heavily on China's input both in terms of the traditional manufacturing sector, for example, the textile, and in terms of the electronic sector. So so really kind of being more independent from China's supply chain is actually much more challenging than what people were thinking last year. And, and obviously, you know, China will be also affected by supply disruptions from other places. The analysis we did found out, you know, actually, uh, okay, it's very clear that the sectors that most rely on, um, uh, you know, in, in China, most rely on external supplies are the electronic, uh, uh, computer electronic sector. Um, and in this sector, the top suppliers are actually in Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Japan. Um, the, but if we take across the board, you know, in terms of, the, of all the sectors, actually U.S. are rent... Uh, among top three suppliers to China's uh, to China's kind of production for for the m- most number of sectors. Huh? So, and then what followed was Japan and Korea. So, th- if these economy supply chains are re- disrupted, then China will be affected, which in turn affects everybody. So, um, maybe I will just end here. I think we can uh, move on to the questions. Thank you, Wei. That's very, very uh, helpful in already answering quite a lot of the questions that we have um, put to us. So I'm just going to start with a couple of questions that cover a number of areas that have been raised. The first one is looking further ahead to the longer term, what kind of legacy do you think this um, outbreak is going to keep in China Thinking of, for example, things like the healthcare 
um, infrastructure and as well as household saving or spending habits as a result of this huge shock. Maybe start with Alicia and then why quickly? Sorry, I, I didn't catch very well the um, the questions. Maybe if you could so, summarize. Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe maybe just um, just make it break it a bit uh, smaller. So, uh, given that we know that um, the Chinese government has spent a lot on additional infrastructure in terms of of, of new hospitals, etc., and managed to mobilize quite well. Um, health professionals between one province and, and, and more different provinces in the more effective areas, um, do, do you think this have a more permanent effect on the provision of health care in the country as well as on the way people will tend to save and, and, and look to safeguard against things like um, health issues uh, later on? Um, well, I mean, I've been following for another reason China's healthcare reform um, uh, on a more structural basis, and especially as regards aging and you know all of the related um, uh, necessary reforms that need to be taken. And, and, and frankly speaking, the contingent liabilities that China will have to face. Um, as a result of aging and the car and the very very low uh, expense still today expense, health um, care expenditure in in the budget I, I think that's really a very important question and topic but my impression and I might not be the best person to answer the question is that I mean just by looking at the number the infrastructure fixed asset investment for the two quarter uh, two months we have data for I mean. Yes, it might look very impressive to build a huge hospital, but the reality is that for China's size, and especially for you know how important excessive investment is for still today for GDP, is is just nothing. So, so in other words, I think you know for this to really have an impact, both in terms of healthcare reform and more of you know like a different type of. Uh, Saving, if I hear you correctly, saving trends because maybe you know households can free some of those excess savings or precautionary savings to consume because they feel that healthcare is taken care of. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't have this impression. Um, but again, I'm not. I mean, I'd like to hear from you what she thinks. I'm sure she has better insights on this one. Um, well, you, I think uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a much better expert either, but I think there is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, report from uh, South China Morning Post, which is talking about China actually had uh, has, has had spent a lot of money to build a kind of early warning system of uh, pan, you know, this kind of you know a, a virus outbreak, but it failed fantastically for a month um, and it really exposed. The defaults in, in in this whole system, which actually goes to the political structure, you know, the local governments they try to hide their instinct is always to hide the problem at the first, um, and there is you know obviously limited freedom of speech, which people are actually uh, criticized and even penalized when they told the truth, right? So so this whole thing. Uh, you know, I think I, I, in, a, in a positive way, I think you know the Chinese government start to realize this is a serious issue, and and uh, given you know the, the you know for the for the benefit of the doubt, right, the, the Chinese Communist Party has always been one able to correct its mistake without changing the total political structure at least until now. So so I I I am more optimistic thinking is they will make changes here to prevent a, another situation like this, like this spending on you know spending on healthcare infrastructure is 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 less of a challenge for them you know they they can do that no problem um, but really how to correct the incentives within the system in, a, in such a top down political structure is actually a more 
um, difficult uh, question for them. Great. That's, that, thank you. That's helpful. Then I have another question here that is also a little bit more um, political, um, but it has an economic angle to it as well. Thinking about the post-pandemic uh, era again, so thinking about when, when the pandemic will potentially hopefully be over, not just in China, but elsewhere in the world, how do you see the relationship between China and the rest of the world um, developing? And in particular, given the, ma the majority of our audience, the relationship between China and the U.S. post the pandemic? Okay. I can start if, if you don't mind, just to follow the same order maybe. Um, sure. I mean, I, I think we had like a, a short honeymoon, which was early December up to um, mid uh, January, so basically when the phase one deal was finally, phase one deal was finally signed. Uh, but the pandemic, I mean, the, the then uh, coronavirus outbreak in China came right after. Um, and I think at the beginning it, it was more like, you know, kind of a realization that it would be very hard for China to go, to go, to fulfill the import targets, the 200 billion because of the collapse in the economy and so on. So it was more like um, the U.S. will have to make some concessions type of idea, and perhaps even on the exchange rate and so on. So, but the 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 spread of the virus uh, and, of course, the seemingly, and this is not for me to judge, but, you know, from the Chinese perspective, or at least what the media reflects, and not only media, but, you know, people, generally well-informed people, is, is like, well, you know, they've, they've proven their ability to control, and now the West is crumbling, and, and I think beyond, you know, the accusations from one side or another, if you just focus on that idea that, um, you know, that reverse story, if I may say so. So the U.S. has been pushing, 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 uh, getting this phase one deal uh, in a way an asymmetric uh, result in, in, in the U.S. favor, at least if you look at tariffs not being... Um, reduce and so on, so, so, and then China getting in, in big trouble, and so, you know, the U.S. magnanimously, maybe, I mean, it didn't happen, but, you know, the idea being, maybe there's this point where the U.S. may even lift tariffs because, or, you know, just to help China, I mean, that, that kind of environment suddenly changed uh, into the opposite. And I think that that in itself is a cause for concern in terms of uh, their bilateral relations. Um, uh, and you can see that also, you know, very clearly in, in the, in, how I say, in, in the tone of the declarations, in, you know, how this is perceived as really, you know, a race, maybe not a, an arms race as in the old Cold War, but a, but maybe a, you know, a sanitary race, a vaccination race, or find the vaccine. I mean, it all sounds very similar, uh, unfortunately, to what we lived decades ago in, in, in the tone now. And, and therefore, I think the coronavirus so far it has only, in my opinion, worsened, uh, I mean, increased the divide, basically, between... Uh, China's perception of the U.S. and U the U.S. perception of China. Right. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I think you know the, the the concern I have also is regarding all these back and forth, you know, about the origin of the virus. Um, this is really not the right time for this kind of uh, uh, contentions. Um, and, and I think the the risk here is, uh, of course, there was much worse risk we can think of. But uh, first and foremost, for the global financial market, is I hope this does not affect the chance of global coordination on policy. You know, if we are in a situation of global dollar liquidity shortage, and in the in a situation that you know we need kind of a widespread. Uh, you know, the U.S. giving swap lines 
to to everybody and everybody need to coordinate on the currency response. You know, I, I hope that that doesn't affect it. Otherwise, you know, it, it's it's just going to be a lose lose game for everyone. Um, and and the thing you know about the U.S. China relationship is it was never meant to be uh, a smooth sell anyway. Despite the the, the first uh, first phase, if you call it, because what's left out of the phase one deal is everything that's uh, much more challenging for the U.S. and China to agree on. Talking about industrial policy, talking about state owned enterprises subsidies, um, which is basically about how the Chinese government runs its economy. So. Uh, I'm not making a judgment call who's right or who's wrong. It's just very difficult for the two sides to get any further beyond phase one, not to mention we have the whole other, uh, several other universes of of problems in terms of tech, in terms of geopolitics. So initially, I think it was only the the, the good thing that, uh, you know, we, we got to choose maybe for a year, but now with the virus actually, um, we don't even have that. So I think we just need to uh, keep the long-term view that the, the, the two countries are going to move apart and uh, how the business should uh, think long-term in terms of uh, how they organize their supply chain, unfortunately. Thank you. And just I'm conscious of the time. I just wanted to quickly ask you on that, um, do you see the supply chain generally shifted out of China more broadly and um, the world becoming less dependent on China um, after the pandemic? Well, again, just follow the order, maybe. I, I, in my opinion, there will be um, what I call corporates with two phases or two ecosystems within a corporation type of idea. So I think for corporations, there will be always be an interest to serve the Chinese market unless it becomes increasingly protectionist. But you know, I, I would argue that that um, unless we go to that irrational behavior, they, 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 there is a likelihood that that although we don't see full opening, I mean, there's no worsening basically you know, of uh, of market access um, and because China also doesn't want to give this image. Uh, that you know, companies are leaving. So we had Toyota's announcement. You know, as people very read about it. I mean, kind of companies are coming in because of that. I think they won't re- constrain further um, market access. So companies, going back to this idea of the of the two ecosystems, will probably have you know different operations, different systems, different think about also you know data um, issues in China for that market and perhaps its neighborhood, you know, you can think of some belt and road initiative countries that may better be better served from China and then, you know, a separate one uh, to cover the rest of the world. I think that I can imagine that happening, which basically means that the size of the of um, of uh, operations of uh, global corporations in China will generally be reduced. Not so much perhaps as, as in the past where process trade was very important for China and it's no longer the case, but still uh, relevant in terms of foreign direct investment, employment, etc. So yes, so, so I would say not all in a nutshell, but that part that relates to the rest of the world and especially the West or, or any country that is not necessarily in China's of influence. I think that that's what, what I think is going to happen. Well, you I have one, uh, one sec, yeah? Yeah, sure. So so the uh, I think one kind of uh, kind of supply chain development is, is the one that Alicia is talking about in you know, the two kind of ecosystem. But the problem that coronavirus showed, outbreak showed, is a different kind, which is you can have Vietnam assembling uh, uh, the, the mobile phone, that the pieces still coming from China, that the two ecosystems may not even work. It's more like a situation like Japan earthquake. You know, you, you you're missing something here, right? And so, so the so so the solution then will be even more costly than building the two ecosystem, which is you have to building backup for every step. Uh, 
and 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 that yes, I think people, I mean, companies will start thinking about it. Will will try to move into that direction, but then you look at now that the virus outbreak turned into a pandemic. So where can you build the backup now if it's this kind of situation, right? So, so I think it's just an impossible problem for the company to solve. But one thing is is very clear, you know, whether it's two ecosystem or building more backup, the cost that the global supply chain is going to fragment one way or another, and the cost of manufacturing is going to go up. So, so the trend of uh, this inflationary kind of uh, impact, kind of uh, force from globalization is indeed going to reverse uh, for, for whatever reason. So. Thank you, Ray, and I'm conscious that we run out of time, uh, so I really wanted to thank our wonderful two speakers, Alicia Garcia Herrero and Ray Yao, and as you can uh, appreciate, we're at tremendously uncertain times and are likely to move from there to even um, more more uh, uncertain times in, in some ways and a lot of other changes that will be happening post-pandemic. So definitely more to watch out for. And I just wanted to turn you back to Chris who will give you a little bit more information. Thank you all. Thanks, Yale. And I want to thank everyone for participating in today's NAVE webinar. Uh, today's program is Copyright 2020 by the National Association for Business Economics with all rights reserved. This does conclude the event. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you again. And then now disconnect.